everybody. Uh, grab your coffee and breakfast goodies and make your way to your seat because we have a full day and it's time to get started. I'm glad you're here this morning. I'm Kevin Moore, the Managing Director of TCG, and I have the great pleasure of talking until everybody's seated. So la we met the San Diego Host Committee last night, and one of the coolest things they organize happens tonight. The dine arounds are a chance to meet and eat with some great San Diego theater people and take in a show or event afterwards. We have dine arounds heading to Tijuana and to some of the great theater that's on the boards in San Diego right now. So if you've signed up for a dine around on Conference 2.0, you still need to purchase tickets for your event. You can find all of the links on how to do so on 2.0 and at the host committee table by registration outside. So most of you I know are a Conference 2.0 pros at this point, but for those of you who haven't signed up, I really encourage you to contact Gus Schulenberg on the TCG staff to set up your profile. Our Twitter hashtag is hashtag TCG1414. And thanks to our friends at HowlRound, we're also live streaming right now and archives of all the plenary sessions will be made available on the TCG website. You can also find the breakout sessions that will repeat posted on Conference 2.0. And I just want to point out, if, there, if you can't find a breakout session that you're interested in, um, the San Diego Shoulder Institute has a breakout session that I thought would be interesting. The Cadaver Arthroscopic Later Jet Surgical Laboratory. I don't know. But seriously, uh, you can find the most up-to-date room schedule and um, scheduled breakouts on Conference 2.0. But for those of you that are fighting the good fight against the virtual world, please make sure you consult the inserts in your program for any changes. And check at the registration table tomorrow for which hot sessions will repeat. Well, everybody seems to be good and settled, right? I mean, yeah, okay. So it is now my pleasure to introduce two more members of the San Diego Host Committee. Barry Edelstein, the Artistic Director of the Old Globe, and Sam Woodhouse, the Artistic Director of the San Diego Repertory Theater. Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to the... Uh, Pacific Rim, deep south, far west, or as we like to call it, border town. Uh, I just a couple of things. First of all, the view out there is real. That's a real place across the bay. Um, secondly, yesterday I woke up, oh, I'm Sam Woodhouse, by the way. Uh, I woke up and checked out the theater listings in San Diego, and I found nine professional productions playing this weekend that I would like to see that have great word of mouth. There are two Shakespearean classics I'd love to see. There's an experimental puppet show. There are two Broadway musicals. The 2013 Tony Award winner is on stage. And there are four world premieres playing this weekend. Of course, I can't see them all. Neither can you. But I invite you to come check out uh, what's happening in town. We have 20 professional theaters here. We're very proud of the, this new hotbed of activity in San Diego. And I also invite you to come to my theater tonight. The entire San Diego theater community is hosting the late night TCG party. At the Lyceum, home of San Diego Repertory Theater, uh, we would all of us who work in theater in San Diego love to see you there. So come party with us tonight. Thanks. Good morning. I'm Barry Edelstein, Artistic Director of the Old Globe. I say good morning, but I'm not sure it is morning. I'm not sure because I never made it to sleep last night. I was at the Old Globe teching my production of Othello until 1 a.m., and then working on lighting with the brilliant Stephen Strawbridge after that. And by the time I got home, my two-year-old son, Augie, was just waking up for his nightly 3 a.m. random screaming of vowels. <laughs> but it's a sound of my passion for TCG, my commitment to the issues of import to the American theater, my wish to see my cherished colleagues, and of course my unslakable thirst for attention, that red-eyed and slurring, here I am. I am hugely disappointed that the dates of my tech coincide exactly with the dates of this conference, and I ask your forgiveness for my scarceness here. I was so looking forward to playing the gracious host 
but the garrison at Cyprus and lust and bloody thoughts and goats and monkeys and the Propontic and the Hellespont have other ideas. And so sadly, I'm spending this weekend in 10 out of 12s directing rather than conferring. Still, welcome to San Diego, or as it's known at the Old Globe, a big old slice of theater heaven. To Teresa and everyone at TCG, thank you for honoring my institution by inviting me to make some remarks. I've only been here a short while, about a year and a half now, but I've learned a few things about my new hometown that I'd like to share with you. San Diego is one of the country's great theater cities. We boast three large theaters, the Old Globe, the La Jolla Playhouse, and the San Diego Rep, whose 2013 budgets together totaled just over $40 million and who played to nearly 400,000 ticket buyers. Then there are about 10 other theaters that are nonprofits with equity contracts of various numbers and full-time professional staffs of various sizes, and a growing number of nimble companies whose small budgets support notably high levels of sophistication. This rich ecosystem is supported by three great universities that train new generations of artists. Wonderfully, many of their recent graduates I've been lucky to meet tell me that they are staying here in San Diego and not moving to Los Angeles or New York, a healthy sign for our future. There's also a massive and largely open-minded audience and exceedingly generous culture of individual philanthropy that recognizes the centrality of the arts in civic life. And importantly, there's an informed critical community, including a mass circulation daily newspaper that still has a full-time theater critic. San Diego, as a municipal entity, is very young, and its keystone institutions will only in the next few years begin to mark their centennials. This season of anniversaries is perhaps inevitably sparking a lot of thought about where the city has been and where it wants to go. Interestingly, all this reflection happens to coincide with a few year period in which a really surprising number of cultural institutions here, like the Globe, have hired new directors. So there's a real excitement in the air, a palpable sense of possibility, and the forward-leaning posture of a body about to spring in some new directions. That's especially true in Balboa Park, where the old Globe has made its home for 79 years. The place is an astonishment, not only for its intense beauty, but also for the 28 cultural institutions that live in it. There are maybe a half dozen major urban parks in the world that boast such density of cultural and artistic activity, but Balboa Park really is in a class by itself. I'm psyched to be there every day, and I urge you to visit. You will emerge, as I do, bullish on the prospects of this remarkable Southern California metropolis. The Globe is the biggest theater in town, and indeed the biggest arts institution of any kind in this city. It's the second largest theater in California and the sixth largest regional theater in the country, 10th largest if you count New York. We have a budget of nearly $23 million, a full-time staff of about 110, and we issued over 600 W-2s last year. We produce a season of 14 plays on three stages, Shakespeare, musicals, new American plays, including both world premieres and increasingly second productions, and revivals of classics of many stripes. We train MFA actors in concert with the University of San Diego, and we're in the midst of a soup to nuts review of our education and community outreach work to make it even stronger than it's been. All of us at the Globe are incredibly excited to have TCG in town, and we're thrilled to see that the agenda of the conference this year is so forward-looking. Community, diversity, sustainability, technology, that's a progressive agenda, and I want to thank TCG and congratulate it on its leadership, which is inspiring. And we need that leadership, and we crave that inspiration, because all of these agenda items are the very issues with which the globe grapples every day. We look to TCG for inspiration. We look to TCG for the power of numbers, the power of collegiality, and the power of a collective imagination. To be sure, the challenges that face all of us doing this work can be truly formidable, and on some days, frankly, enervating. There's no shame in admitting that. Just two weeks ago, Northern California lost a major regional theater, and two months ago, the San Diego Opera went through a near-death experience that shook this city. And yet, from a purely artistic perspective, in terms of the plays being written and the performances being given and the direction being conceived and the design being executed, I honestly believe that the American theater right now is the healthiest it's been in the nearly three decades I've been working in it. There's joy in admitting that. 
As the artistic director of a great American theater, it's my privilege to talk in public about why in the world these institutions might even be necessary in the first place. Yes, I can do the bean counters, song and dance of economic impact, job creation and restaurant meals eaten by our ticket buyers and hotel rooms booked and how a thriving cultural sector makes it easy for corporate recruiters to lure executives to San Diego and, 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 and. But in practice, I find that that speech is greeted most often by polite nods and glazed eyes. The more engaging speech is about what I've experienced bringing 400-year-old Shakespeare to vivid contemporary life for American audiences of all kinds, a richness of laughter and a fury of gasp and groan that makes huge and manifest the ties of common experience which bond people across vast cultural chasms. The more useful speech is about what it means when a philanthropist chooses to use her generosity to build a city, a young one like San Diego, by investing in the simple notion that art and art alone imputes value to people, and that art is therefore indispensable not as some indulgence, not as some caprice, not merely as a source of an escapist giggle at the end of a long day at the office, but instead as a civic principle, as a matter of citizenship, as a passport to full participation in the society in which one lives. The more provocative speech is that on the eighth day, God created narrative. And that, and that humanity's ability to tell a story is the signal quality that truly separates us from the animals. The gorgeous fact that the Globe's outdoor Shakespeare theater actually butts up against the San Diego Zoo means that the very architecture of this city's greatest temple to storytelling is in itself a metaphor for all that makes human beings human in the first place. And the more inspiring speech is about what every one of us in this hall knows. We labor in these strange buildings with big rooms that have seats in rows and a platform at one end. We tear our audience's tickets and they sit in those rows and then we plunge them into darkness. They gaze at a special species of people who wear funny clothes and pretend to be things they aren't. And two hours later, when the darkness ends and the light comes back, there's been some magic some act of alchemy, some transformation that is ephemeral and gossamer and spiritual, and it has somehow helped that audience glimpse just a tiny bit more of what it means to be human. People in San Diego like it when I give that speech. I like it when I give that speech, because when I do, I really mean it. The circumstances of our work may be challenging, but we are lucky that we get to do it. It has value and it endures, and it matters to us and to the world. This gathering of passionate and committed people of the theater gives me the ocular proof. Again, welcome to San Diego, a great American theater town. Drink some craft beer, hit the beach, see a play. On behalf of the Old Globe and the entire San Diego theater community, let me say that we are thrilled that you're here and we look forward to learning from all of you in the next two days. Thank you. All right, thanks, Barry. Thank you, Sam. Barry, if you didn't tell us you were up all night, we would never know. So um, uh, now it is my great pleasure and my great honor to welcome the TCG board chair, Diane Rodriguez, to the stage. Diane is an Obie Award-winning theater artist and the associate producer and director of new play production at Center Theater Group in Los Angeles, California. Please join me in giving a hand for Diane. Wow. Day two, yes. I've already been inspired. I've already been challenged. And I've already had my fill of carne asada tacos. I tell you, they are the best in the world here. But here at, uh, at TCG, uh, it is not business as usual. One of the core ideas of TCG is that it serves individuals working in the theater. That's all of you out there, theater workers and theater artists. It doesn't serve the theater, 
or the building, but rather those that work inside and those that work outside its confines, making work for their communities and for our theaters to produce. The myth about TCG that we serve only the large theaters, no. The myth about TCG that we favor only small theaters, no. We are invested in both and all that is in between. We are invested in artists that are writing our plays and supporting those plays artistically and who are making or devising work together in a rehearsal room. We acknowledge that the future and survival of our theaters and our field relies on social equity and aesthetic evolution. The TCG board is made up of theater professionals, independent artists, and practitioners in other fields. And among many responsibilities, we serve the mission of TCG, and we support the brilliant and expert TCG staff and serve as their brain trust. And I would like to introduce uh, my colleagues uh, today, uh, those members of our TCG board that are here. And as I read their names, would you please stand and hold your applause until I finished, and then we can give them a roaring thank you for their service. Sarah Bellamy, Patrick Bradford, Ralph Bryan, Joshua Dax, Larissa Fasthorse, Cynthia Furman, Amy Hayes, Michelle Hemsley, Robert Hupp, Chris Jennings, Tim Jennings, Marshall Jones, Kwame Kwe Arma, Max Leventhal, Kate Lumpoma, Kevin Moriarty, Jonathan Moscone, Eric Rosen, Michael Rosenberg, Tim Sandvert, Rock Schulfer, Mark Valdez, Clyde Valentin, and Megan Wanless. Thank you. Woo! Woo -hoo -hoo! New England Foundation of the Arts is a forward thinking foundation and has, ha has been a steadfast supporter for American artists who tour both in the dance and theater world in the United States. For the past four years, NIFA has given sizable touring grants to our national ensembles who devise work or who make work collaboratively in an effort to create touring, a touring network for our American artists. Artists receive monies to support a premiere, and like money in the bank, these funds can also offset touring fees for presenters and producers. It's an amazing program that can support efforts to bring an ensemble and present them in your theater and, we, and, and how great it would be if more TCG theaters invested in this program and used it. This is a foundation that opened a door and held it open for our theater artists to enter and to tour. Because of that, TCG would like to present the 2014 National Funders Award to the New England Foundation of the Arts. Keita Sullivan, Program Manager, accepts the award for NEPA. Woo! Oh, there really are a lot of you out there. Thank you, Diane. Um, on behalf of my colleagues at NIFA, the National Theatre Project, 
our former ED, Rebecca Blanc. Um, it is a great honor to accept this TCG award. Um, thank you so very much. We consider it a privilege to support artists, presenters, and theaters that are doing such amazing and exciting work. Our programs support artists across many forms of expression, many geographies, connecting them with collaborators and communities, fueling creative exchange and public discourse, and strengthening the creative economy. The goal of each program and project that is brought to life at NEFA is to build a stronger and more dynamic infrastructure for the arts through grants, convenings, online tools, and research. After the initial research and planning in 2009, NIFA created the National Theater Project supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Modeled in part on that other program, program you probably know, the National Dance Project, um, NTP was designed as a program that would promote the development of new artist-led ensemble and devised theater work while extending the life of those projects through touring. The work supported reflects the evolving theater environment, exposes audiences to exciting new work, and nurtures partnerships between artists and development and presenting partners. Not including the next round of grantees, NTP in these four years will have supported 25 projects that have or will have traveled to 28 states and the District of Columbia. Projects that have been supported come from companies and collaborations that you already know well to some that you don't know now but will soon know. Um, the, from the Wooster Group and City Company to Mondo Bizarro, Progress Theater, and Complex Movements. Presenters that have received subsidies and travel grants range from national parks and military bases, from regional theaters to retirement homes. TCG theaters can and have participated by bringing NTP projects into your spaces, not merely for performances, although we really do like those, um, but also by extending your generosity and nurturing projects during development, working with them on creating other partnerships that will help the project move. Because we all know it's all about who you know, it's all about the relationship. Um, and we're a big fan of co-pros. And also just spreading the word that there's some really, really great work out there. And although I have the honor of standing up here and accepting this award, um, I'm not NTP, the National Theater Project, all by myself. Uh, there are many people who make this program work. Um, first, I have to acknowledge the support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Uh, without them, this project would not be possible. So thank you, Susan and Katie. I know you're out there somewhere. Um, and all of the folks at Mellon. Um, but other funders have supported NTP. Thank you to the California Community Foundation, and the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs. One of the most par fun parts of doing this job, of aside from seeing theater, which you know is the fun part of all of our jobs, um, I have had, and NTP has had, and benefited from the care and expertise of 18 people who have served as advisors. So I'm going to go through this really quick. Diane, Rob, Michael, Morgan, Shay, Clyde, Mark, David, Kathy, Chuck, Mike, Colleen, Howard, Lisa, Mayen, Carlton, Lane, and Ryo. Um, as well as the dedication of others who are or have served on the NTP team, Sandy, Elizabeth, and now Mina. Uh, Mina Melek is our new program coordinator. Get to know that name. Um, and of course, Jane Preston, our interim co-executive director and director of programs, and Rebecca Blanc, who retired from NEFA after 29 years of serving the arts both nationally and regionally. And of course, last but not least, there are the incredible artists that NTP has the privilege of supporting. So on behalf of all of us participating in this great experiment that is the National Theater Project, thank you, TCG, and all of you for this award. almost saw me bite it right there. I almost fell down and embarrassed myself. Thank you, Keita, and thanks for all that you and NIFA do to support theaters across this country. We are truly, truly grateful. And now, 
I am really excited about this next part. We have a really fun infomercial from the editorial staff of American Theatre Magazine, um, who have been working hard on developing a new online version of TCG's now 30-year-old publication. It's really going to revolutionize the way you receive your theater news in the future. Please join me in welcoming Editor-in-Chief Jim O'Quinn and Senior Editor Eliza Bent for a really exciting glimpse of American theater's future. Hello, welcome to Friday. Um, how many of you in this room are readers of American Theater Magazine? Looks pretty good. How many of you would like to be able to read American Theater online on your computer or your iPhone? Hmm. Interesting reaction. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, it's going to become uh, possible because um, American Theater, after, uh, as Kevin said, 30 years of publication, is finally entering the 21st century with a brand new website. It's called www.americantheater.org. It's already live if you'd like to go, go there and see a preview of what's about to happen. Um, we're launching this electronic version of American Theater this October with our season preview issue. And uh, we're very excited about it. Uh, speaking of online, uh, let me also point out that uh, right now you, you, you can go to the TCG website and see reports by American Theater staff on what you've been doing and seeing yesterday uh, and the day before, uh, along with uh, um, Misha Daniels' wonderful, always wonderful photographs. So there's already reports uh, on the TCG website about the conference at this point. But um, back to americantheater.org. Uh, Eliza Bent, senior editor, is going to take you through <clears throat> some of the um, uh, things you'll be able to do and see with this new edition of American Theatre. Eliza? Thanks, Jim. I hope everyone packed their bags because we're about to go on a screenshot safari of americantheatre.org. As Jim said, we'll be launching in October, and I'm going to go over not only what you can expect to see and how you'll benefit from our online presence, but also the kinds of partnerships and opportunities that will be available to you. Voila! <laughs> Theater magic. The AmericanTheater.org homepage. This features our latest stories in a photo flash box containing, containing highlighted tales of teatro with updated content daily. Our navigation bar easily lets you sort between the hard-hitting news you've come to depend on, such as who has won which award, who has traded job places, uh, the photos and features that you love to flip through and the videos that you can't help but stare at. Uh, the left navigation bar contains information about TCG and American theater, including the magazine's history, our masthead, and how to contact us. Scrolling down, uh, you'll see recently posted articles and sidebars listing our most popular stories and news. I repeat, our staff will be updating this content daily. The revolution will be online. Okay, uh, all right. Donald Trump himself told me that he was envious of the prime real estate at the top of our page. Advertising real estate, that is, oh, okay. Here you can show off your latest productions, your latest class offerings, whatever it is that you want to show off. Um, we've also got homepage advertising on the right and left sidebars. Uh, next up, we have an example of a story page. Tag, you're it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Each story, <laughs> each story will be tagged for city, state, theater company, and artist. This system uh, that we'll be using uh, will be able will will be able to organize.
pages of content about a particular person, a member theater, a region of the country, uh, or a nation around the world. Um, advertising can also be targeted to type of content or by geolocation. So if you're advertising a show in Minnesota and you only want that ad to appear on articles about Minnesotan theater, we can do that for you. If you want only Minnesotans to see your ad, done. You're welcome. <laughs> Not to brag, uh, but I'm going to brag. Another great feature uh, about this new website is that it will enable us to show more production images of more productions from your theaters. Um, woo! Uh, so we plan to use this photo gallery feature for our design-centric production notebook department. Uh, but we also will be starting an online-only feature titled Opening Night. You can probably guess what that means. It's a highlight of shows opening on a particular evening around the country. As Jim would say, I know, can you believe it? <laughs> Is it hot in here or do I have archive fever? Yes, I just referenced Jacques Derrida's meditation on remembrance. And yes, that means that the website will have a full digital archive of all of the magazine's content since 1984. Uh, this here gives you, woo! Yeah. That's pretty great. Uh, this gives you a glimpse of how uh, all of the past issues are going to be organized so that you can find the entirety of any issue online with the click of a mouse or the flick of a finger. Bottom line is that we won't have to ask Jim if he remembers when a certain article was published. And that's not a good thing. It's a great thing. Okay. Thank you very much for waking up so early in the morning, uh, for being here with us, for, for bearing the cheese and corn of these jokes. But I really would be lying if I didn't say that we aren't beyond thrilled about what this new website means for the publication, for the field, and for you, our people. Uh, American Theatre Magazine's revitalized online presence means more coverage of more people like you, projects that you're involved with, and theaters and places where you're working. Uh, and that's not a good thing. It's a totally super awesome thing. Uh, okay, we're confident this digital initiative will secure our role as the leading voice in the conversation about not-for-profit theater across the country and around the world. Uh, but you don't have to wait until the fall to visit us online. You can check out our landing page, which is www.americantheater.org. And there you will find out more information about what's coming up, and even pitch suggestions about what we should cover. I shudder to think about my already exploding inbox. See you online in October. Thanks. Eliza, your jokes in real life are much funnier than that. Just once. Uh, no, I'm kidding. We're really, really excited about this, obviously. And thanks, Jim and Eliza, for that. That was great. Um, uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, who has her own exciting vision of technology in the future, Jane McGonigal. Her New York Times bestseller, Reality is Broken, How Games Make Us Better and How They Can Change the World, makes the case that the gamer spirit an attitude of fun, dedicated, collective problem solving is our greatest asset as we face the problems of the 21st century. She has created games for the World Bank, the Olympic Games, the American Heart Association, the New York Public Library, and much more. She also has a background as an off-Broadway stage manager, and she received her PhD at UC Berkeley here in California in performance studies. In other words, she is one of us. So please give Jane McGonigal your warmest welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Well, thank you. I can't tell you how excited I was to receive this invitation, because anyone who knows me in real life 
or who follows me on Twitter knows that there is nothing I'm more passionate about than theater. In fact, I annoy the many thousands of gamers who follow me by tweeting more about the shows that I've seen uh, than the games that I've played. Um, and this is a little known fact. I actually got my break in the gaming industry when I was a first year student in the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies at UC Berkeley, and I convinced a new gaming startup that they needed a stage manager for the live action elements of their game. And I, I, I'll be in charge of the actors and the props and it'll be great. And that was my first gaming job. Um, so here I am 14 years later, still trying to bring the power of theater and games together to change people's real lives and to solve real problems. And, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I wanna thank you for spending some of your time this morning taking games seriously because it's not something that people often do. You know, we think about games as being trivial, they're, they're fun, but they're, they're pretty much a waste of time, right? But, but today we're gonna take games seriously together as a way to empower communities to change their own lives and to maybe even change the world. And I thought no better way to start taking games seriously than to share with you some good news. So are you guys ready for some good news? Yes, okay. Here it comes. A billion gamers worldwide. Humanity has recently reached this critical milestone. This is a billion people who spend at least an hour a day playing video games. You guys look less excited about this news than I was anticipating. Okay, that's fair enough. I, I know, because we worry a, a billion hours a day playing games, that sounds like too much time. Um, and to be fair, uh, people who worry that we spend too much time playing video games, they do have some compelling statistics on their side. For example, the fact that we collectively spend 300 million minutes a day playing Angry Birds, um, that's a lot of time. Uh, that's 400,000 years so far that as a species, uh, we have spent avenging this terrible crime. You know, the, the bad piggies stole the eggs. They got mad, and then we got mad on their behalf, and we're still mad. Um, or think about a more hardcore game like Call of Duty. The, yeah, all right. <laughs> the average Call of Duty player, you included, I'm sure, uh, spends 170 hours every single year playing just this game. By the way, imagine if you could get every theater goer to spend 170 hours in your theater every year. They spend 170 hours playing just this one game, Call of Duty games. Uh, that's the equivalent of a month of full-time work that every gamer is spending on just this one game, a month of full-time work. Um, and in fact, recently, one in four players worldwide called in sick to work when the new Call of Duty game came out uh, to stay home and launch. So uh, gamers are playing games like it's their job. Um, and there's some, there's some research that can shed some light on this phenomenon. Um, Gallup, uh, which studies uh, happiness and engagement at workplaces worldwide, they recently discovered that 81% of global workers are not engaged at their jobs. What that means is that people show up at the workplace and they don't think there's meaning or purpose to what they're doing. They don't feel like they're developing skills and abilities. They don't feel like their signature strengths are being called on every day. And they don't feel like they're a part of a community or something bigger. Um, and uh, this means that people are deeply unhappy and they're spending the majority of their day or their nights doing something that they don't care about. And this engagement problem starts earlier than the workplace. In the United States, the longer you stay in school, the less engaged you are. Kids show up in elementary school, eight out of 10, feel like there's meaning and purpose to what they're learning and they feel optimistic about their chances for success. By middle school, it's only six out of 10. And by high school, only four out of 10 still feel optimistic about their chance for success. Only feel uh, four out of 10 feel like there's a reason to be doing what they're doing at school. Um, this incredible engagement gap, people not feeling appropriately challenged and inspired at work or at school is why we have seven billion hours a week being spent on video games because video games are an environment where we have the chance to develop new skills and abilities, where we have the opportunity to connect to other people who are equally excited about what we're doing together, where we can be inspired by heroic stories and incredibly difficult quests. And these seven billion hours a week, I feel are a resource for artists, 
for activists, to get folks who are looking for wholehearted engagement with difficult challenges in video games to feel like they can tackle wholeheartedly difficult challenges in real life. That, that as artists and activists and, and community leaders that we can engage with gamers in something more than just the virtual world. Um, these numbers, by the way, are only going to go up these 7 billion hours a week. If you look at the gaming demographics, 99% of boys in the US under 18 and 94% of girls under 18 play digital games at least an hour a day. This is another piece of good news, by the way. We've closed the gender gap in gaming. <laughs> Um, yes, I know. You may laugh, but it's true with all the benefits, the cognitive benefits and the learning benefits and the technology confidence that comes with games. This is really good news. Um, and in fact, 92% of two-year-olds in the United States are already playing video games. 92% of two-year-olds. Um, I love this picture, by the way. I don't know if you can see the drool coming down. Uh, I think it really sums up the next generation's feeling about digital entertainment. Um, so it reminds me of this quote by uh, cultural uh, critic columnist Rob Mayhe. He said, you know, it's inevitable, soon we'll all be gamers. And that's true for all of you as well, by the way, because we're going to play a game in about five minutes, so get ready for that. Um, but what is it that really drives gamers? Um, I've been researching this for more than a decade. Um, and if there's one thing I want you to think about, the power of games, it's this list up here. This, this is a list of the top 10 reasons why people say they play games. Um, thousands of gamers studied worldwide over two years to try to understand what feelings do games provoke, what do you seek when you play, and what is it that games successfully provide you. And it turned out that it's positive emotion, that when we play video games, we're seeking to change how we feel. We don't want to feel bored or lonely or angry or frustrated or uninspired. We want to feel these 10 emotions. We want to feel joy. We want to feel relief. We want to feel love, right? Because three out of four gaming hours are spent playing collaboratively rather than competitively, if you were curious, and building these strong bonds with other players. Uh, we want to feel surprise. Something unexpected happens in the game or the story. We want to feel pride. We're getting better. We're setting goals. We're achieving them. We want to feel curiosity. You know, what's going to happen next in the story? What's the solution to this puzzle? We want to feel excitement, uh, get that adrenaline going, get the high interest levels or physiologically, mind and body at peak excitement. We want to feel awe and wonder, right? Which is what you feel when you're connected to something bigger than yourself. It could be the massively multiplayer community. It could be a heroic story that gives you goosebumps. We want to feel contentment, an underrated positive emotion. It means we wouldn't rather be doing anything else. We're happy exactly with where we are and what's going on. The number one positive emotion that gamers say they seek when they play games, and this should be very interesting, I would think, to the performing arts community, is gamers say they want to feel creative. Right? They're looking for an opportunity to use their creative talents, to think of new strategies, to build something, to, to, to work out problems, and to use that creative agency to make a difference in the world. It's a virtual world, but it's still a world, and that sense of creative agency to make decisions and try strategies and learn from your mistakes and fail and get better. That creative agency is the number one thing that gamers want to feel. Now, I want to give you a first-hand experience of all these 10 positive emotions. And if, if games are so good at provoking them, I feel like the best way to do that should be by playing a game with you. So my little challenge for myself is I'm going to try to provoke all 10 of these positive emotions in you in roughly 60 seconds. So does that sound like a good idea? I think it does. OK. So uh, I'm going to teach you one of my favorite games, and we're all going to play it together. Uh, this is the game. It's called Massively Multiplayer Thumb Wrestling. Uh, so this is, this is thumb wrestling for the gamer generation. We've got we to bring it up a scale. Um, and uh, I, I want to play this with you because this game really requires a lot of people. So it's hard for me to play in my normal life. Like, you need at least 50 or 100 people to get a good game going. So, um, so thank you for agreeing to play it with me because I don't get to play it very often. Um, I'd love a few volunteers, maybe three or four people, to come up on stage and help me demo it. Anybody who wants to come, please just come on up. We're all going to play, but there we go. One, two, three. OK, great. If you're moving, you're on stage. Good, good, good. All right, that's a lot. Hey, hey. Oh, look at you going. All right. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> OK, so 
Uh, before we start, does everybody know traditional thumb wrestling? One, two, um, your David's going to help me out. One, two, three, four, I declare thumb war, and we wrestle, and David beat me because he's very good at this game. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> now, we're the gamer generation. We need a bigger challenge. So David, come back over here, and, and I think, is it Nicole? Nicole, come on and put your thumb in here, too, because we could all wrestle at the th same time, right? And we could even, you know, oh. come on over, uh, Molly. Molly. Uh, could put her thumb in here. And we could all wrestle. Now, this is the most important rule. If you miss this rule, then you'll be hopeless at this game. It's the first person to pin someone else's thumb that wins the hand. So, oh, I lost. Yes, Nicole <laughs> beat me already. Uh, so you don't want to wait over here and like, oh, I'm going to let them duke it out, and then I'll sweep it at the last minute. No, you're too late. You're the first. You guys, you can see this game's awesome, because they're not even going to listen to me. They're just going to keep playing. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. By the way, a little, uh, a little warning to everyone when you play. If you are a big, strong man or woman, don't squeeze too hard, don't hurt anybody. And if you have beautiful long nails, do not dig them into anybody else's palm. Just be thinking about that. OK, um, so that would, be, uh, that would be good. And if I could get the slides back up on the screen, we can see uh, that this is the typical hand. Now, you don't have to hold yourself back. You can be ambitious. So for example, um, as many thumbs as you want to put into the node, you can. But So this is good. But gamer generation, I think we can be even more challenged. I happen to notice we still have thumbs lying around, right? So maybe we should find some other people to wrestle with. So here's Jet, and maybe reach out. Let me grab Joy with, you just grab her, yeah. And then maybe Joy would reach I, out I with her. Yes. Right now. OK. <laughs> they, they can hear, lift. Oh. You can see where, uh, you can almost see on the screen. All right. And then the idea is that you get all thumbs connected. Now, if we have more people, I could reach out and grab them. And Joy, you could reach out behind you. Just demo for me, yeah. Reach out, you grab some other people. And the idea is that we get everybody in the room connected in one node, OK? Everyone <laughs> reaching across aisles, reaching behind you. You guys are going to be very good at this game. I love it. OK. Um, <laughs> Dave Ziggy. And uh, you wrestle both your thumbs at the same time. That's, that's, the, that's the other exciting part. So um, you guys are ready to be kind of like experts. OK, you guys. All right, and that's how you play massively multiplayer thumb wrestling. OK, break it up, break it up. Let's go. Back to your seats, back to your seats, back to your seats. All right, good job. Now, before we all play together, I just want to give you a little more insight into this game. So there are different levels of the game. So this is sort of the basic level. We're going to play the basic level today. You can see everybody reaches out and grabs hands. Um, but some more advanced levels. Uh, this is called the Death Star configuration. So <laughs> you're a science fantasy geek. You get what that means. Um, this is, for science geeks, this is the Mobius strip. You loop back on this infinity. It's, it's existential. Um, and this is the hardest level. Um, so. I think TCG 2015 will, will reunite and we'll, we'll go for this level. But we're going to go for the basic level now. And just to remind you, here's how it works. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to form the network. If you're on the aisles, you have a special role. Make sure you reach across the aisle, because if the thumbs only count towards our high score if everyone in the room is connected. And we're going to go for a score of about 1,700 uh, thumbs I think we have in the room right now, which will be the highest score in California this year so far. So um, after you get the thumb, the network made, don't start to wrestle until I say go, OK? So stand up. Let's make the network. You have 30 seconds. Go. Good, reach across, reach across. Good, good, Gra yeah, grab that thumb. Somebody grab that. You can do it. Look for that. Grab that thumb. All right, if you have a free thumb, wave it around so someone can grab it. All right, we're going to do a last minute thumb check. Who has a thumb not connected? Wave it around so we can get it in. There's one there, there's one there. Grab it. Are you in? Grab that thumb bag. That lady, we cannot wrestle till her thumb is in someone else's hand. OK. On the count of three, we're going to wrestle. One, two, three, go.
Yeah. Did you win? You got that hand? Good, good. Yes. Well done, well done. Nicely played, nicely played. All right. You guys did great. All right, I'm going to call that a score of 1,730 thumbs. So we'll see if anybody beats that this year. OK. So let's do a little recap, see how we did with the 10 positive emotions. Uh, let's start with curiosity. I said massively multiplayer thumb wrestling, and you were like, I've never heard of that before. What is that? How does that work? I got you a little bit curious. Creativity. So it actually took some creativity, uh, especially with those last few thumbs. How does this go? We have to do it like this. I have to reach around. So we did some problem solving together. And you guys were creative, and you solved the problem, which was great. Um, surprise. You know, the, the feeling of trying to wrestle two thumbs at once is an unfamiliar sensation. So there's a little bit of surprise when you start to do that. Um, excitement. Uh, you heard the sound that went up in the room as you started playing and like, you know, hey, uh, you know, you're really good at this or this person's really into it. And so there's like a little bit of <laughs> excitement going on. Um, you had some relief, right? The relief of you've been sitting here for like 45 minutes. You got to stand up and have some physical relief to your bodies, not, not having to sit still and be silent. Um, how about contentment? I didn't see any of you checking your text messages or sending emails while we were playing. So I know you were content with what we were doing. Um, how about Pro oh, no, joy. What, you, did you guys see your faces? You had a lot of fun. I'm going to call that joy. If we played for another five minutes, it would be like bliss. But we'll, we definitely got <laughs> to joy. Um, uh, pride. OK. So um, no, we'll do love, love. Uh, so I'm like a really big science geek. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is oxytocin, which is a neurotransmitter. And the more oxytocin you have, the more you like the people around you. You, you want to help them. You trust them. Um, you feel really connected. And it turns out that one of the fastest and most reliable ways to increase the oxytocin in your bloodstream is to hold someone else's hand in a safe setting for at least six seconds. So you guys do the math. You were all holding hands for way more than six seconds. Uh, so your oxytocin levels are sky high. You have been biochemically primed to like each other and want to help each other. <laughs> yes, this is my gift to you. Uh, take advantage of the networking opportunities. If there's a favor you want to ask or a card you want to hand out, uh, you're biochemically primed to want to help each other now. Um, this is the last, oh, all in wonder. Um, uh, well. All in wonder means being a part of something bigger than yourself. So how cool is this? When was the last time you came to a theater or a hall and you were physically connected to every single person in the room, right? So we have everyone at TCG was physically connected for just a minute. I think that is literally awesome, literally wonderful. Um, and finally, pride. So um, how many of you are like me? You can admit it. I always lose both thumbs no matter what I do. Just admit it. Who lost both thumbs? That, that is totally cool. Don't worry about that. Because you learned a new skill today, right? You didn't know how to play this game before you came in here. Now you do. So you have leveled up in life. Uh, you, you've learned this amazing skill. Uh, how many of you won just one thumb? You've won one of your thumbs. All right, good job. I've, uh, speaking of pride, I have good news for you. According to the official rules of massively multiplayer thumb wrestling, this makes you a grandmaster of the game. Um, it's because there aren't that many people who know how to play it, so we have to, we have to like, accelerate the process compared to chess or something like that. Um, how many of you won both your thumbs? You're amazing. That is very good. Uh, so get ready to update Facebook, Twitter. Uh, you are officially legendary grandmasters of this game, so congratulations. Now, uh, if you would like to become a legendary grandmaster and you didn't have much success this time, I will just, we'll finish this game by uh, me giving you my best advice. If you want to be a legendary grandmaster, so first of all, make sure that both of your hands are in different nodes. You'd be surprised. People, you can't win twice if you're both in the same node. So both in different nodes, and then scope out the people around you and try to pick out the, the people who look kind of weak, like they're going to be they're very easy to get. Okay, so you're going to start with that hand, and uh, as soon as you know, the person says go, do something crazy with this hand so nobody can possibly win. As soon as you knock out the weak side, stop moving suddenly, swoop in for the kill, and you are a legendary grandmaster, so congratulations. All right, that's good, that's good. Okay, so. <laughs> 
why do these positive emotions matter, right? So I'm, I'm a scientist in addition to a game designer, and my favorite thing to research for the past few years has been the power of positive emotions to change how we think and act in real life. Um, there's a lot of research. If you're interested, uh, if you can just remember, show me the science. I've put hundreds of these studies on my website. So you can go to showmethescience.com, like show me the money, show me the science. Um, but the most important bit of research has to do with the fact that the more positive emotions we feel, the more determined and motivated we are in the face of difficulty, in the face of adversity. That if we can have, on average, two, three, four positive emotions for every negative emotion we feel in our daily lives, that we are less likely to give up in the, in the face of adversity, that we are able to recruit allies, that we have more energy to pursue the goals that we want to pursue in real life. So these, these positive emotions have a real impact on our mind and body. They allow us to do things that are difficult, to become more ambitious, and to develop more support from our friends and family for the goals we want to achieve. Um, and I thought, I, I, instead of science, um, let me just show you this beautiful portrait series of, uh, of what gamers look like when they're playing. And I want you to see if you can spot the signs of resilience on their faces. So remember, this resilience means you, know, you are motivated by challenge, you don't give up, that you just you wholeheartedly wrestle with things that are difficult, right? That is resilient. Um, it's very subtle, so look closely, but I think you can do it. Okay, here we go. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you, you, I, don't, I don't need to say anything. You guys get the idea. Um, the good ones had grit and determination. Um, this guy, who said playing games was like escapist passive activity? You can see playing games is quite hard work. Um, this is the bliss, this is the flow face. We lose track of time. You know, and it's three hours later, we're still playing Candy Crush. What happened? I don't know. Um, and uh, this face, this guy's one of my favorites because I think uh, if you didn't know he was playing a game, be like a little worried about him. Um, the nostrils are flared, the pupils are dilated. Um, I think it's safe to say he's about to fail, but the great thing, uh, the great thing about having those 10 positive emotions to power you is that you can fail constantly. Gamers fail 80% of the time. That's, that's the typical uh, experience of it's failing and you learn from your mistakes. So you can have a face like this where things are going very poorly and then just a few seconds later, you know, you have a face like this. Where, like this is like before and after. Um, you surprise yourself with what you're capable of. You achieve this kind of, of epic win. Um, and when I look at these faces, it makes me think of this, this uh, quote I came across in graduate school, actually, by a psychologist of children's play, Brian Sutton Smith. He wasn't studying video games. He was studying children's play. And he said, the opposite of play isn't work. It's depression. Now that is true. And, and it's so counter to what we've been taught to think about play and games. We've been taught to think that play and games should be uh, completely separate from work, right? Because they're trivial or they're escapist. But in fact, as you can see from those photos, one, gameplay is very hard work, right? It requires our attention and our hardest efforts to achieve a goal. We can also see that it's really the opposite of depression. Because when we're depressed, we lack optimism. We lack confidence in our own abilities. We lack the physiological energy to engage with things that are difficult, right? We withdraw from the world. But, but when we play, it's the opposite, right? We're full of energy. We're full of confidence. We believe that extraordinary victories are possible against all odds. Um, and that sense of purpose and meaning even to our actions, that there's a reason why we play, um, that there's an important mission or story to be told. Now, what's really cool for science geeks um, is we can now see into the games of brain, uh, the brains of gamers while they're playing, and we can see that gameplay is literally the opposite of depression. So Brian Sutton Smith said that you know, 30 years ago that the opposite of play is depression. Well now, uh, this is at Stanford University, thanks to their fMRI research, we can see that literally, neurologically, gameplay is the opposite of depression. Let me show you what I mean. Um, this is a comparison of uh, somebody playing a video game, the one that's all lit up, um, versus somebody watching a video game. So by the way, the benefits of gaming, you can't just be an audience member. You have to play. That's why we play together, because there are no benefits from watching someone else play. The benefits come from being an active agent yourself in the game. And uh, the, the researchers discovered that there were two really important differences um, between playing a game and just kind of watching someone else play. Right? 
um, being an audience member. The first difference is in the caudate and the thalamus. The caudate and thalamus are the motivation centers of the brain. When these parts of the brain are lit up, it means that you will do whatever it takes to achieve your goal. Um, now, this is also the part of the brain associated with addiction. So you may have seen some rather sensational headlines in the past year or so. Uh, video games light up the same part of the brain as cocaine, because it's true. Because when we become addicted to drugs, we will do anything it takes right, to get what we want. But in other areas of our lives, you know, if we're trying to learn a new skill, we want to uh, train for a marathon, we're, we're learning a foreign language, um, where we don't want to give up, right? Uh, it's we love to see that part of the brain lit up. The more motivation and determination, the better. Uh, the reason why this part of the brain lights up when we play games, of course, is that every game gives us a goal, right? You have to rescue the princess, you have to defeat the enemy, you have to get the score, you have to solve the puzzle. When we play a game, we accept a goal voluntarily. That goal energizes us, it concentrates our attention and motivation on a challenge, and that's why we get the cauda and thalamus going. So that's wonderful. It builds motivation and determination. At the same time, the hippocampus is going crazy. The hippocampus is the part of the brain associated with learning and memory. The more this part of the brain lights up, the faster you learn, the more effective learning is. And the reason why this part of the brain lights up when we play is because every game is designed for us to be bad at it the first time we play. So uh, you know, the next time you do the thumb wrestling, you're going to be better because you're going to learn from your experience, right? Um, there will be a next time. Trust me, you will play that again sometime in your life. Um, and the hippocampus, uh, it goes crazy because we want to get better. That is, a, that is the, the pleasure of gaming is improving our skills, right? And, and if we get really good at a game, we usually find another game to play, right? It's why as adults we don't play tic-tac-toe because we're done learning. We, there's nothing left to learn. We have to play a game that will continue to drive us to learn. So this is kind of the one-two punch of gaming, of, of, of all games, not just video games. This desire to achieve a difficult goal and the thrill of learning and improving, right? And these sort of two character strengths of perseverance and love of learning that games develop in us. Um, I like to talk about this neurologically as the state of a super empowered, hopeful individual. A super empowered, hopeful individual is somebody who believes that they have a realistic chance of making a difference in someone else's life or, or in, in the world around them. Um, they feel optimistic. They feel like they have real skills and abilities that can make a positive difference. And what I want to turn to now uh, in the remainder of our time together is you know, what would it mean to use our American theaters to create super empowered, hopeful individuals? What if we could use our spaces and our artists and our community to help our audiences become super empowered in their own lives? Um, and I thought I'd show you something today. I've, I've never shown this in a talk before, but here we are at a Crossing Borders conference. And uh, it, it reminded me of something I saw actually when I was just finishing up my PhD. So we'll, uh, we'll play this video. Will you um, click play for me, please? Um, so uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty local to where we are now, and we don't need to hear the audio. Um, and this is the wall that separates the United States from Mexico. Um, and we're the gamer generation, so we don't see a wall as an obstacle, right? We see it as a platform for play. Um, and in fact, this is a project, uh, Viva Border Volleyball, um, that brought people out to the beaches to play volleyball over the fence that separates the United States from Mexico. That's great, right? <laughs> I love this. I love this. Um, and in fact, this is not some newfangled gamer idea. I actually found this just this past week. Um, this idea goes back to 1979. A community in Arizona has been doing this every year since 1979. And the whole community comes out to play this game across the wall. And uh, this, is, uh, this is such a great example because it, I think in a nutshell, it shows what games can do for your community. It gives them an invitation to act differently to transgress a little bit community norms, um, social uh, responsibilities, and it tells them exactly what they can do. You know, they don't have to improvise. They, there's no performance anxiety. If I show you a volleyball court, you know what you're supposed to do. It gives you a way to participate without having to truly be a performer yourself, right? Because it's so natural when we 
hear the rules of a game, you know what to do. Um, and that is the beauty of games, and it's the beauty of bringing games back into theater, um, is the possibility that people don't have to be comfortable performing in order to participate, and that we can all understand the rules of the game to make it easy and comfortable for people to participate. So what I show you now is uh, a game that I made um, that I personally consider a performance event um, and, and not just a game, certainly not just a digital game. Um, and it was sort of inspired by World of Warcraft and games like, like that, um, these MMORPGs where people come together in large groups online. You might gather 50 of your friends or 100 of your friends to tackle a truly epic quest. You're, you're going to go on a raid. You're going to do an epic battle. And you all have to show up at the same time in the same virtual space to work together. And everybody brings their different skills and abilities that evening to achieve the goal. Well, what if we could do that in real life? What if we could use our community spaces, our most beautiful and inspiring community spaces that are certainly as epic and grand as anything in a virtual world, and we could bring people together to ask them to be creative in that space, to solve problems in that space. Uh, so the space that I was lucky enough to work with is the beautiful Stephen Schwartzman building for the New York Public Library. Um, if you've never been, this is the one that was in Ghostbusters, so you probably at least have a visual. It's gorgeous. Um, and uh, they, the New York Public Library has a problem, though, which is that young people don't like to go to the library anymore, um, if they ever like to go. I mean, really, now they do not like to go. Um, they do all their research online. It's all Google and Wikipedia. Um, but these are amazing physical spaces that inspire you when you walk into them to think bigger thoughts and, and to dream differently about the future. And, and there's also the, the benefit of coming to be in a space with other people, other thinkers, other researchers, other scholars, other learners, other creators, that just by being in the same physical space, there might be that synchronicity of something new um, arising. So we, the, the library wanted to bring young people to the library. Uh, they didn't know how to do it. They thought maybe a game would help. So they asked me if I could make a game. And they had terrible ideas. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the worst ideas were probably some of the ideas that you thought I might get up here and talk to you about, these sort of gamification ideas. So I know we'll give people points every time they come to the library, and we can give them an achievement badge for visiting different collections. And um, the reason why I thought this was a terrible idea is that you're trying to motivate people to do something that you want them to do, right? I want you to take out books because I'm the library, and that's, that's what I want. But what about what they want, right? So as a game designer, my first job is to imagine what would be an extraordinary accomplishment for the gamers. What, what goal would they love to achieve, but maybe they don't have the resources or they don't have the confidence that they could achieve it? So one thing I found out in the course of my research is that young people, 91% uh, of them, want to write a book someday. Now, 91% do not want to read a book, but... <laughs> It's sad, but true. But they want to write a book. They feel like they have something worth saying. They, they have a voice that should be heard or a story that should be told. Um, and that's interesting. So I, started to, I wanted to keep that in mind, that young people want to write a book. Um, I still wasn't sure, so I asked them to send me some inspirational material to draw on. Um, and they sent me all these old archival documents and um, different things in the collection. And there was one document they sent me. As soon as I saw it, I knew I could make them a game. This was the document. Um, this is uh, published in Scientific America in 1911 showing this new library and this amazing technological feat where they were storing books eight levels underneath the ground. And this is, in fact, how they store books in the library today, to this day, 100 years later. There are eight levels underneath the city streets of Midtown Manhattan. If you walk around Midtown Manhattan, you are walking on top of a city of books. How cool is that? Nobody knows that. It's like the secret city of books underneath the city ground. Um, and as soon as I saw this, I knew I could make a game because, do you guys see it? Like, this is basically Donkey Kong. Are you right? You were like, <laughs> okay, so my idea was, inspired by the eight levels of the library, I would create an eight level game where if you got to the top level, you have written a book that will be printed on demand, listed in the card catalog, you are a published author with the New York Public Library, and your book will go on the physical stacks of the New York Public Library. Your book is real, and it's in the stack. So that was the idea for the game. I'm going to show you a trailer for the game now, and then I'll explain how it worked.
Excellent. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, a uh, funny story about that trailer. So the idea was we would launch this game on May 20th, that would be our opening night, and we would lock 500 young people into the library overnight. This is inspired by the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil E. Franklin. I don't know if any of you guys read that when you were kid, yeah. Uh, that was the first idea I had when I was still talking to them. I was like, oh, we want you to do a game, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, can I lock people in overnight? We'll get back to you. <laughs> Uh, but they agreed, and uh, we were going to lock them in overnight, sunset to sunrise, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Nobody's allowed out till they write a book. Um, and to find people to come for opening night, uh, the game was going to run for a year. You come to the library anytime it was open for a year and play this game. But opening night, uh, we put this trailer online. That was it. And we're like, oh, I hope 500 people will want to come and do this. Um, and I, got, uh, I heard from the, a member of the board of directors, a very senior gentleman um, who'd been with the library for many years, right after we put this trailer online, he was very upset with me. Um, it was a grave concern in his voice. And he said, he said, Ms. McGonigal, is it possible that you will humiliate the library with this video? And I said, oh my god, what do you mean? Um, well, you have, you've just promised, you've told the world that we will have 500 young people spend a Friday night at the library. We, we can't even get three young people to the library. <laughs> on a typical weekend, and this is a Friday night, and it's overnight, and what if nobody comes, and, and you know. I said, okay, yes, that would be terrible. But in fact, we had more than 10,000 young people apply for those 500 spots, yeah. They had to write an essay just to be considered to, uh, to come on that first night. Um, and here are the 500 uh, first players that we chose pouring in. We locked the doors behind them. We played the same music from the trailers. They came in. It gave everybody goosebumps. It was awesome. Um, and. Uh, and uh, now you're wondering, how does playing a game help you write a book? Um, I actually came up with the idea three months before I solved the problem. I said, I said young people want to be published authors. This game is going to turn them into published authors. It took me three months of hanging out at the library, wandering around, having very bad ideas, um, to come up with one that worked. And the idea was we created an app. Um, and they, they downloaded it as soon as they came to the library. And the app would take you through the library looking for these 100 artifacts that had inspired humanity and changed history. Artifacts like, um, well, you can see here people wandering around looking for these artifacts, like the Declaration of Independence, um, which the library has a copy of, and not just any copy, but you can see a copy that Thomas Jefferson was working on at the last minute, scribbling things out, changing the words around, um, which is be interesting. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and they would, we put QR codes on all these objects, and some of them were books on shelves, and some of them were things you could touch, and some of them were behind glass. Um, and, and they would use a QR code to prove that they were face-to-face -face with history, right? They were having this face-to-face this -face moment with an object that had changed the world. And once they were there, we told them a secret about the object. Um, so for the Declaration of Independence, we pointed out, do you see that section that scribbled out that criticized the institution of slavery? Did you know that with the Declaration of Independence, we were originally supposed to start talking about the slavery issue, calling for an end to slavery. Thomas Jefferson's friends talked him out of it. Um, isn't that interesting that at the last minute, Thomas Jefferson wasn't sure what's, what's the right thing to do? Well, you know, how far is too far? How much is enough? Um, and he, he, that insecurity and that doubt and needing his friends to give him advice, we thought that would humanize the process of making history because you could see that this wasn't this, this document that changed the world, but in fact there was all this sort of human um, questions and doubts and, and desire behind it. And so every object when we shared that secret, we were really trying to help the players see themselves as people who might someday change the world. So they could relate to these people who had changed the world. And the last thing was that every object came with a writing quest to help you write this book. So for the Declaration of Independence, the writing quest was to make your own declaration for today. That was written hundreds of years ago. What needs to be declared today? Um, and most importantly, you need to find 56 people to co-sign your declaration. That's how many people signed the Declaration of Independence. So here's a player that night standing on a table in the Rose Reading Room reading the declaration he wrote because he finished that quest. Um, and he, as I recall, wrote a declaration of interdependence. The too much uh, competition today. We're too independent. We need more dependence and interdependence and collaboration. It's a very millennial thing to say. Um, and he's trying to, <laughs> trying to get people to come and sign it by reading it out loud. 
Um, now, we wanted to have the book published at the end of the night, the first book, so we found this guy in Brooklyn who had been trained in the UK in medieval bookbinding techniques. So he showed up with this like torture contraption and uh, all this leather, and he was sewing together the book as we went. Every time the players finished a quest, we had editors uh, from New Yorker magazine, from Penguin Books, they were there to copy edit and line edit, and then we printed out the pages and they were stacking up like a progress bar over the course of the night. Um, this is what the Rose Reading Room looked like at 3 a.m. It had never looked like that before, uh, except for once, uh, they told me later, they had rented 300 Xboxes and held a Halo video game tournament. Um, that was the last time they had that many kids there. Uh, I felt like our game was a little bit more on mission for the library. Um, <laughs> You're wondering how they stayed awake all night besides all the free pizza and coffee. Um, they were very creative because gamers are creative. This guy, without asking anyone for permission, brought a vuvuzela, that, that horn from South Africa that makes the most annoying sound in the world. Um, he just wandered around the whole night blowing it <laughs> to make sure you weren't asleep, which was very good. So at the end of the night, the 500 players had collaborated to write 1184 stories. These were all stories about the world they wanted to make, the future they wanted to see become a reality, or the dreams they wanted to fulfill for themselves uh, in their own lives. At 6 a.m., they lined up to hand sign the book, not just as the way you would autograph a book, um, but, but also as a commitment, as a pledge uh, to making this future a reality. Um, and we called the book 100 Ways to Make History, Volume 1, because the game was playable for a year. So people would come the whole year and make more volumes of this book. And in fact, there was an online version so people could play from anywhere in the world. And there are different versions with different answers to these writing quests in libraries and schools um, all across the world. Now, the big epic win for this project for me was originally the New York Public Library had agreed to put this book in the general research stacks, right? So the stacks that you saw uh, in the diagram. Now the general research stacks are, they're good, but that's where, you know, all the new stuff comes. If there's like a new uh, biography of Beyonce, that'll come in there, and then like in 10 years where no one cares, it'll go away, and who knows what'll happen to it. Um, tw 20 years, we'll give her 20 years before no one cares. Um, but uh, at the end of the night, when the president saw what the players had created and, and how amazing it was, she stood up in front of everybody and she said, we, the New York Public Library, pledge to defend your book for as long as New York City is standing, which is amazing. And they put it in the rare books collection <laughs> next to the Declaration of Independence, next to a Gutenberg Bible. These are the only living authors of a book in the rare books collection. That means they can visit it <laughs> for the rest of their lives. They don't need an appointment. They can bring their friends today. They can bring their kids someday. They can bring their grandkids today and say, this is the book that I wrote that the New York Public Library thinks is one of the most important texts ever created in the history of humanity. So that was an epic win for our players. Um, so what, I'm, uh, what I hope to share with you today is that these 10 positive emotions that games provoke can help people strive to do things that would seem impossible otherwise, whether it's making a political statement, bringing two countries together with you know, border volleyball, or getting to write a book and be a published author in just one night and to collaborate with 499 other amazing people. By the way, two people who met that night at the first library game got married last year, which is amazing. I know, we love it. Uh, so you know, try to remember these 10 positive emotions. If you can't remember them, just remember the faces of gamers and the opportunity that we have to bring people together in our spaces to uh, become super empowered. Um, I would like to state for the record, I've been telling people this for the last two years, I would like to produce and develop my next game for an American theater. I want to create my next game in a theater uh, and for a theater. So um, I hope to see many of these faces in theaters um, over the coming decades. I'm going to be signing books outside now, and uh, I hope that you will come and talk to me and share your vision for the future of theater and play and games. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Aww. Wait. Don't sit, I have to take a picture. That's nice. Uh, I'll show my husband. <laughs> Thank you.
my God, is that like the coolest thing you've ever seen in your life? Thank you, Jane, that was fantastic. Like, like she said, she's gonna be signing copies of her book, Reality is Broken in the TCG Bookstore and Lounge right out 